morning. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to make the photocopy of the class lecture notes. So you can pick it up right after class or I'll bring it back on Monday. And I, I also have the answer keys, but I need to make a photocopy. So, how's everyone doing? Um, I haven't graded the midterms, I mean the module three exams either, so I'll hope to do it today and bring it back on, on Monday. Um, and so, are there any questions about the homework, homework assignment, homework project, sorry? Um, I'll, I'll go through on Monday, like sort of like what we did for the previous homework project, you know, sort of what is expected and stuff. So, um, right, does that make sense? So, so it's, it's model after what we did for the, the previous project. And I want you to run through and tell me how many uh, accesses you would need and sort of we'll, we're covering those topics in the, in the next few, few lectures. Um, so the, the last lecture was probably kind of rushed. I, mean, I was doing a video lecture, and um, and part of the reason is that you know, I figured that most of us have used file systems most of our, of our life. So we kind of know how you know what, what files are and what directories are to a large extent. So, um, so today we'll, we'll cover more on the implementation details of how, how these things are implemented, some of the different ways of implementing these things. Right? Are there any questions about the last lecture? What, what files are and how directories are organized and stuff like that. Right. If not, we can go to the, the implementation aspects of how, how you would, how would do this. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about how directories are implemented and how files are allocated. And these sound a lot similar to how we did page, page allocation and stuff way back when. Um, the, the only difference here is, you know, file systems tend to be uh, persistent. I mean, we write some files, you expect them to stay around. So the issues of how, how you do it, when you do it, you want the data sections to be consistent and stuff like that, right? So the, you know, you know like we looked at before, files are a logical collection of, of, of data um, set up into, a, into an object notion. And files typically exist in secondary storage. Um, and we'll see later on there are Operating systems have special ways of abstracting other stuff as files. You know, there are, there are ways to access terminals and um, serial ports and stuff as a files in different operating system. For now, we assume files as the traditional files we look at, like file as a, uh, a thing on the disk. And so it, 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 it's, it usually lies in a secondary storage like disk or floppies or what have you. And so when you have a disk, we haven't looked at how a storage disk looks like, yeah, which we'll look, look in the next chapter. So for now, we, somehow we have, some, you know, it, it's stored in some media. So there are a number of different things which are, which are set in, in, that, in that disk, right? One is when a system boots up, it needs to boot off of these storage media. So it needs to boot off of hard disks or whatever. So they have a notion of a blue con boot control block and have some Data there. So if, if you so the operating system when it boots up would read that partition to know what to do next, right? So there's a there's a boot up process which is inherently involved with this stuff because when the system boots up, it needs to start reading the operating system. Operating system lies on the on the disk and operating system is stored in some file format. So when it boots up, it needs to know how these file formats are set up, but that is actually in the file system, so it needs to know how the whole thing works, right? So if you buy a hard disk and then install Linux on it, your operating system is installed, let's say, in Linux. <coughs> so the, when the firmware comes up and it starts to boot, it needs to boot up that process. It needs to figure out what the file system is, but the file system, the idea of how the file system is, is part of Linux, which is actually hasn't been booted up, so there's a chicken and egg problem. So the way you solve it is you actually have a boot sector on the hard disk, you know, say the, 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 you know, the, the zero whatever information contains the boot block. So when you start off, you always go look up, look up there, and whatever code is in there would get you started to move forward, right? 
And once you read that, you know how to read file systems, then you can go on to read the rest of the rest of the stuff. And some of you may have had problems with this in, in way back when in the first homework project. When you have when it's booting up, it doesn't know how to process some of the stuff. I don't know how many of you had the issue, right? But you get error messages like, you know, can't read EXC3 file system or something. Right? So essentially it's trying to boot boot off of the stuff. Um, then you have information about the different kinds of partitions or volumes or whatever on, on the particular file system, right? So when it reads a hard disk, it needs to know something about the partitions and, and different stuff on the on the storage. Then it needs to know about directories and, and files and, and so on, right? So it, it needs to kind of progressively read all this information to know what to get, right? So that's the those, those are stuff are on the disk, and um, to a large extent, you kind of boot your operating system off of that. Then you start reading what different directories or different um, devices are there, and start start your boot up process. And then directories and, and, and uh, files are stuff that we will will see in the in the lecture now. Those happen after the the, the, the operating system is booted up and, and working fine, and how the implementation is, is what we look at. Does that make sense? So the, the typical way you implement that is a, is a layered approach where you have the devices at the very bottom and then you have, have control and a basic file system. And we'll see later on why we have this notion of a basic file system and a, a logical file system built on top of it where the applications um, interact with them. And essentially the reason is there are multiple different file systems on the same machine, right? <coughs> Some of you may be aware of this. If you're using Windows, you know, you can set your file system to be FAT16, FAT32, NTFS, or what have you. And if you're using Linux, you have, you know, ext2, ext3, whole slew of file systems, right? So those are the basic file systems. But if you want to write a file system driver and everything for each file system, then it tends to be laborious. So you have a notion of a logical file system that you write into, and then somehow it mapped, gets mapped into whatever these underlying file systems are, right? And that's the way to implement the file systems. So you have a notion of these little different layers, which keep the implementation fairly simple, right? And and you have a notion of a file control block, which is similar to your process control block. We say something about a file. So it says the different things that a file has some different attributes, right? The permissions and access access um, access bits, you know, file size, and a pointer to the data blocks. We'll we'll see in the next few slides how the how that's assigned. So essentially, this is sort of like a process control block. It it's there for every open open file, and it keeps track of all the information that a process needs to access a, a, a given file. Right. So. Let's look at two operations and what happens to the in-memory in data structure and stuff. So when you try to open a file, right? When you open a file, you have to first look through the directory structure to figure out what file you're looking for, right? So you essentially go to the directory <laughs> structure, which you keep it in memory part of it because you know, you're, you're, you're searching through them, and figure out where the file control, where the particular file information is, right? So up in the top, you have the if you try to open a file, right? You find the directory, you go through some directory structure, figure out what file you're looking for, which tells you information about where the information about the particular file is, the, the gray block, right? And you read it, and so now you know, have a sense of what file you're actually looking for, right? So when you, when you want to operate on the file, there are, there are two data structures involved at this point. One is a prior process file structure and one, one is a system-wide file structure. The, the difference is the per process file structure keeps track of your current file pointers. If you keep reading a file, it needs to keep track of how far you've read and where you, where, you know, what's your context in the particular file. <coughs> so you have per process open file table, which tells you what the current status of your application is. And you have a global file table, which tells you all the different files that are open in a, in a, you know, in a particular operating, you know, particular system, and so essentially, you know, you go to the per pro, per process file table, 
to say what your current pointer is. And once you know that you're reading byte offset 200 or something, then you look at the global file table to figure out where in the disk that 200 is, and then try to read, read it, right? And we'll see how this, this thing is organized in the next few slides, but essentially you have, you know, each, each process is trying to operate on a file and it's in a different position. And then you try to figure out where those structures are in, in disk. And these are similar to what we did for the, for the paging and stuff. You know, you have to map from where each process is reading to what, what is in the hard disk. So, so the, the, the notion of like why we have virtual file systems, right? And like I said, there are different different file systems on, on a particular particular operating system. So, at least in, in, in Windows, you have NTFS, FAT32, FAT16. Um, there are file systems for your you know CDs and, and stuff, right? And so, how many of you know what kind of a file? How many of you use Windows? So do you know what kind of file system do you have for your, um, yes? NGFS. <coughs> so, yeah, if you use Windows XP, you probably use NTFS. Do, do you know why you have NTFS or you just use it? <coughs> it scores a lot larger files. I mean, you can create contiguous files of like essentially, you know, 20 gig infinite length as opposed to that 32, which is a lot more limited. In terms of file size and okay. Was that the reason that others use NTFS? Oh, the security too, because they've got the access control list versus FAT32, which had that security essentially. So, how many of you use Linux or Unixes? Do you know what file system you use? I use XFS. Yeah, it's Okay. Okay. So, but each file system has its own pluses and minuses, right? So, if you if you if you know what you're doing, you kind of choose certain file system over certain other file systems because, I mean, if you can ask people and they'll say, oh, XFS has blah, 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 and RaceFS does you know, stuff, and exe 3 does certain other stuff. And, you, you know, when you're asking in, in the Windows for NTFS has better security and all those things, and FAT32 would let you still boot to Windows or what have you. So there are different reasons why people choose different file systems, and each one has its own strength and, and weaknesses. So given the fact that there are a lot of different file systems, right, and, and Linux has like a lot more. I mean, I think there's like 30 or some odd file systems which are standard in a, in a given installation, and each one of them has its own pluses and minuses. So once you have all these file systems, if you directly export that file system to the end user, right, then you're gonna have a whole bunch of different options, right? So the, the key here is each file system, some of the file systems provide more functionality than others, right? Like NTFS has a much stronger notion of um, security and access control and all those things. So if you export that directly to the user, then you would have to kind of change the API for people who use FAT32 and, and, and change the API for using uh, NTFS and stuff. And that's unwieldy, except especially when you think of like Linux and stuff where you have like 30 or so file systems. So the way you do that is have abstraction layer. You know, uh, so all the file system implementers would implement something that can be uh, read by the VFS layer, and the application directly talk to the VFS layer. So essentially, it gives you all the capabilities that the system knows about. So if you come up with the capability that we haven't thought of, then you can't go through this model, right? But some file systems may not implement all the functionality, right? I, I hope to show you how one of the Linux structures of how this is done. So, for example, all file systems would have to support certain basic operations, like open, read, read directory, and, and so on. But some of the other more you know, interesting options may or may not be have there for that particular file system. So you would, you would set some table of what functionality is being done. Um, so essentially, this this lets you use all these file systems without actually knowing what what changed, right? So some of you may have done this. So if you're using, for example, FAT that you know uh, FAT32 file system in Windows, right? You can change it to NTFS. You can there are tools to modify it to NTFS, and essentially change under the hood 
from application perspective, nothing would change. I mean, you'll still be able to access the same files, and and the underlying stuff can change because you're interacting through the the VFS interface, not the underlying stuff. Right? It also comes into play when you're using it over the network. Like if you're using NFS and stuff, it transparently hides you, hides the fact that it's it's not in the same machine and stuff. We'll go through a little, very little of the networking aspects in this in this class. So more more pictorially, this is sort of what you have. So you have the the various file systems um, showing up through a single interface from from the user perspective, right? And all these things talk about like the file system having a a, a disk, but it's not true for the not necessarily true, right? I mean, you can access your, like I said, serial ports and modems and stuff through the file interface, but this is a simpler diagram to look at. So the, the first thing we want to look at this point is, so we have a, a file system with a certain, you know, uh, set up in a certain way, right? So from the last lecture, we know there are different ways of naming these things. There are different ways of creating directories. You know, you can have single level, multi-level, tree structure, or, or what have you. So once that's all set up, right, you need to figure out how the directory is actually laid out on the disk and how the allocation happens on the disk. And that's what we are focusing right now. So the first thing is to figure out how the directories are implemented. Right. So directory is basically gives information about all the files that are <coughs> that are a collection of files. So so essentially it, it will have a list, you know, have information about a whole bunch of files. And the question is how would you organize it on the disk um, such that you would reduce the number of accesses to the disk. Right. The underlying theme in, in all this, so before going through some of the mechanisms out there, you know, we can work through how you would implement this, right? So if you take the case of a disk and assume that the disk has certain certain blocks of data, so assume that this you can write stuff in in certain fixed size blocks, right? And we will see that depending on the medium that you use, there are things like seek and other latencies to read them, right? But at a, at a fairly high level, you have a bunch of blocks sitting up there, and they're all the same as far as the, as the hardware con is, is concerned, right? So the question is, how do you set up some data structure here which will implement the notion of a directory, right? So directory, conceptual sense, let's assume it has a bunch of uh, information that has ARC, BRC, it has a make file and then it out, and so on, right? So logically, you have a notion of a directory, say like this. How would you map it onto the disk blocks in such a fashion that you can have a fast access? So fast access is if you have to search through these things really fast, right? How do you make sure that things are laid out in the disk? Such that you avoid having to read stuff back and forth from the disk, right? So one of the things that we have to remember is, as we move along in the semester, we are using slower and slower stuff. So the stuff you're using right now, this are the slowest stuff that uh, on a machine, right? So what you don't want to do is have like a here, dot here, and c here kind of stuff, right? It, it seems sort of obvious. But you don't want to do something like this because reading this would mean that you need to get all these three disk blocks. And this is a especially slow operation, right? So you want to make sure that you can you can do the most amount of stuff before you bring this stuff back in. Right. And we haven't really seen how how fast, how slow disks are, but usually the disk, you know, operation to get something from the disk is an order of milliseconds. Right? There's memory, main memory is an order of nanoseconds and stuff. So this is very slow operation, right? So some of the ways that this are, the directories are organized are, are one of the main thing is, 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 is a linear list. And it's sort of like you have a list of stuff like here, right? So you have the information about the different files sequentially like this, 
right? So what would be the problem if you have uh, a linear list of files? Search time would be too long because if you have a million entries, you, know, you might have to search you know, a million entries before you to Yeah, so depending on how you sort these things, searching would be very slow, right? It'll be very slow because it'll have to map into some disk blocks, right? So this, let's say this I map into this disk block, this, you know, there are two entries per block or whatever, right? So if I have to search, so if I want to look for File call a dot out, and if you're doing a sequential read, right? So you read these first two entries, and you don't see it. So you basically read, have to wait for this block to be read back, and then you search through, you know, search through the entries and find the entry, right? So if you have this structure, and you have only four files, it's one thing. So if you have a million entries, and if you have a very large directly with a lot of files, linear search could be extremely slow, right? It's extremely slow because you're not even actually looking at the actual file yet. You're trying to find out what, where the file is, what the information is. So linear search could be slow, but it may not be so bad if you expect uh, a small number of um, f files per directory, right? So the, the way you organize your directory or, or how you use the directories play a large role in how, how you would set these mechanisms, right? So would this, you know, hypothetically, would this be a good good way of organizing if you're, if you're having a single level directory? In a single level directory, you have one directory for all the files in the system, right? So some of you are nodding no in the back, right? So because essentially if you have a single directory, so unless you have this whole data section in memory, Right, you're you're expecting a lot lot of files in in one single directory, so you, you can it, it's going to be slow, right? Whereas in, in stuff like Unix and stuff where you have a tree tree structured um, directory structure, you expect very few number of files in, in any one directory, right? So again, this is another case of people doing studies to see how many files people typically tend to use in a directory to figure out what mechanism to have, right? So the, the first first mechanism uh, um, <coughs> talk about here is the linear list. It's simple to implement, simple to think of, but it could be potentially slow. So one of the, one, one way to speed it up is to augment this with a hash table, right? You still have a linear list, right? But you, you hash new names to somewhere here. So let's assume that we hash it based on the um, the first letter or something, right? So then you would have to sort this, keep this sorted. So essentially it will say A is here, B is here, and so on. So you have one one structure here which tells you um, essentially, you know, in, in the large array, kind of short circuit and let you search through stuff a little quickly, right? Now, of course, if you have hash table, you have collisions. So there are, you know, for example, here there are two of these files. So you have to figure out how to search within the same thing. But this essentially would can let you speed up a little bit by, by maintaining another structure here, right? So hashing just keeps the linear stuff, but adds a, another way of searching through the stuff faster, right? But the essential problem is you want, depending on how large this is, you're trying to make these things faster to read. And real operating systems also have notions of B tree. So you can implement all kind of data structures you can think of to speed up this process. You can have maintain B trees and stuff. Different newer, newer operating systems tend to use a B tree structure to help you speed up this process. Right? You're doing this because this is a very slow operation, so you want to. So now you're talking about, if you're talking about milliseconds, your, your OS can do, you know, millions of instructions within that time. So it has time to optimize to do the best job it can for to avoid the disk I.O., right? So far, when we talked about process scheduling, we said if you want to keep the amount of instructions they can execute to be fairly small because you're operating at, at a very <coughs> high speed, so you want to do it as quickly as possible. But whereas here, since we're talking about this in tens of milliseconds, right? 
you can afford to be smart about it. You can afford to do a lot of calculations on over here rather than going to the disk. Right? And, and we, as we'll see, there are different kinds of hard disks. Some are faster than the others. So if you're, if you're trying to operate on something like a floppy disk or something, then it's even slower. You want to optimize on those. So the next thing we look at is is the is the problem of allocating allocating uh, allocating these data blocks to files, right? So let's take this off. Let's say we have a file called file.c, right? And we want to again this is some you know some notion of a blocks. And we want to allocate stuff onto your hard disk, right? Or, or your storage has a notion of blocks. So you want to allocate new blocks for your file, which map into your your storage media, right? And this is very similar to the problem we did for memory allocation and stuff. I mean, you have a notion of cache or whatever, and then your main memory. And we are doing different kinds of allocation, right? And we had notions of external fragmentation, internal fragmentation, depending on how you allocate it, right? The same stuff happens here, right? If the storage can allow you to allocate whichever way you want, sort of like your segmentation, right? Then you'll have a notion of external fragmentation. If the storage lets you allocate in little chunks, then you would have a notion of internal fragmentation, right? I hope people still remember external internal fragmentation, right? So it's essentially, so if you, if this happens to be, say, 512 bytes, and if you allocate one byte, so you would use one byte of the uh, of the stuff, and you place 511 bytes, right? So the, so once you have, sort of similar one, um, so what are the different ways you can allocate, allocate the space onto that medium? We've done this before. We've, before looking, without looking at those, right? We have done these kind of allocations before. So, what are the different ways you can think of allocating these these structures when you when you have? One wants to. What's the simplest way we can think of? So essentially, let's say this is one, two, three, four, five. I need to map the stuff here, right? Name one way I can allocate this. We've done this before in terms of memory, right? Yes. Just do it directly one one two two. Just make it continuous. Yeah. So you just pick up some random order. So I'm just going to make it a little interesting by choosing stuff like this, right? Right. For some reason, I chose something like that, right? Which is what we did in the main memory allocation. You know, we didn't try to have it contiguous. We just said we are free to choose whatever we want up here, right? And this scheme would still work. This scheme would still get you what you want. But turns out that some storage media operate differently than other storage media, right? So one of the things that we 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 had we, we haven't talked about the media yet. So let's let's in a general sense this will work, but for a specific sense this may or may not work, right? The issue here is if you're using something like main memory, all memory locations are sort of equal, right? But if you're using something like a disk, there are some things which are better than something else, and I, I'll, we'll see what what they are in the in the next chapter. And again, it depends on what kind of a, a system you have. But essentially, some, so depending on what you read currently, reading you know, certain other things may be faster or slower. Right? So you, you've probably seen this with your, with your CD or, or something. Right? So CD has a little virtual arm kind of going around. So it may be the case that after reading this, right, reading the next one may be trivial because of the way the hardware is set up. Right? So it may be faster to read this than to read this. So from a correctness perspective, you could set it up like this, 
But from a performance perspective, something like this may be better, right? Because they are sequential, so depending on how the system is set up. So for, for now, think of it as like the old-fashioned record player, right? So when it reads, the arm, the arm is kind of going around physically like this. So if you read the, you know, this one, next one is sort of there with no cost. So again, it depends on what kind of medium that you have and stuff. So depending on the kind of media that you have, certain arrangements may be better than certain others, right? So you want to exploit that. So you want to set it up so that the allocation not only just gives you the space, but also allocates in a fashion that is aware of how the layout is, right? And this is a very hard problem, right? What we'll see in this class mostly is, is sort of like an idealized view of how the disk works and how these things operate on. Real disks are a lot more complicated and you have to worry about a lot more about how to place these things, right? Because you're trying to figure out what ordering would really help you for performance on the hard disk, on the CD, on your whatever stuff, right? And you may, you may do a good job. So you're trying to abstract away all the low-level information. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit hint later on after we go through the whole uh, module, how real systems may make it more complicated. But the, but the larger scheme is you're trying to make sure that you leverage as much of the hard disk as, uh, the storage as possible. So if you have a hard disk, this may be better, right? If you're using flash, which some of you may use in different uh, storage stuff, right? You know, if you're using your iPods or little the MP3 players and stuff, right? They have flash memory, which doesn't have any physical um, stuff moving around. So for them, this may just be OK, right? But there are other issues with those, right? How many of you used flash memory for something? You probably, a lot more people actually use it for other stuff than you realize, right? Maybe in your cell phone, it may be in your cameras and, and what have you, right? So one of the stuff with flash memory is flash memory, you can only write so many times before the memory gets becomes useless, right? It's like, say, 10,000 times or, or something like that, right? So there, it may not be the performance of keep pacing these things, but how many times you use the same stuff. So you don't want to use the same one particular page over and over again, because then it'll become useless, right? So there are different ways of organizing these things. So if you stay with the files, then a certain sequential order is preferable, right? So that drives our allocation that we look at. Like, how do you organize it such that it's fast, using the, the hardware the way we want it, right? So the first, the, the three things we look at is contiguous allocation, right? Sort of we, what we do the memory, sort of which helps out here, right? We want to use the fact that reading stuff back to back really helps us. So instead of allocating just one block when you need it, allocate a whole chunk so we know we can be sure that it's, it's contiguous, right? Um, and linked allocation and index allocation, which basically violates some of these principles, but lets your files files grow, right? And we'll, we'll see more, more of them in, in detail in the next few lectures. Sorry, next few slides, right? So the first, first is contiguous allocation. So here you want to make sure that something like this does not happen, right? You know that contiguously reading stuff is faster, so when you allocate, when you start a file, you can start off by allocating it a certain amount of chunk, right? So if you knew if you knew how big the file is going to be, you can allocate all at once. So that suppose you you know that the file is going to be five blocks and never change, then when you start up, you can allocate five and be done with it, right? And you know for a fact this all all in one go, right? So what what are the problems you would face? Um, if you allocate all the blocks that you need for a particular file. Yeah. You don't know how to make the files. I mean, if you want to add the file later, you have to reorganize it. Or 
Yeah, so you don't, yeah, one, one of the things you don't know how big the file is, right? Very few files you know exactly what the size is. If you're copying a new file, then you know that you know the, the previous file size is the new one that you want. But in general, you don't know what the file size is, right? So you have to either allocate the maximum that you could allocate to a file or what have you. So a pure continuous allocation is is unwieldy. I mean it it, 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 it won't let you grow the file size. Right, <coughs> but if you give it a larger size, so if you assume that all blocks will take, all files will take five blocks, right? And you allocate five blocks for everything. So small files would waste a whole bunch of blocks, and large files can't grow, right? So, but it, it, it's it's fairly simple. So, you know, in, in terms of the allocation, your directory structure is a lot lot more simpler now because you essentially have have to keep track of what's the start and how, what's the length. So if you kind of have it organized like this, so file count starts at zero, goes for two, file F goes for you know, 14 and goes for three and so on, right? So you have to figure out a, a large enough hole to place your file. This will work if you knew how big the files should be, or files will ever be. And if you don't know that, and if you want to grow a file, right? So if you take, for example, the file mail, which has it as a length of six, right? It's starting at 19 and goes off like that, right? So if you want to grow that mail to seven, it's sort of easy. You can just grow because the, all the, this empty space, right? The, the the clear box is there. But if you want to grow that file mail file to say 10 blocks. Essentially, you would have to either move the file list somewhere else or, or find a new space, copy these files over, and then start start from there, right? It's, it's simple, but it, it, it has issues of not being able, not, not flexible enough, right? So you see a variant of this in in higher performance file system so we, we'll see in the next 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 few slides me methods of having uh, index structures but even though you have mechanisms which are sort of a linked list based kind of mechanisms which are a lot more flexible you still want the benefits of of what you what you get from contiguous allocation so high performance file systems like sort of you what you get from veritas which they, they make uh, extremely uh, large high performance file systems for enterprise kind of stuff, they allocate in what they call extent, right? So you can set up what this extent is. So essentially, it gives, it gives allocations for you in, in, in say, let's say the extent is a megabyte. So when you ask for a file, it gives you a megabyte worth, and it, it keeps them all contiguously. And um, so if you want to grow the file, you grow them in chunks of whatever the extent is. Right? So it gives you the best of both worlds. It, it lets you, so it allocates you in a large chunk, but it lets you kind of concatenate them to form larger files, right? So even though this, the, the simple state allocation seems kind of have a lot of problems, it's still useful because it gives you very high performance, right? A more flexible scheme is you use a, a, a linked allocation. Linked allocation basically has pointers from each block to some some next block. So you kind of follow these pointers to make the file larger or smaller, right? So in the general case, it it loses this this contiguous nature. So it, it now kind of mixes up stuff all over the place. And there are different ways of organizing these these pointers, right? So essentially, now you have something like you have block one. There is this some space you can't really use for anything else, and You have a pointer to where the next block is. So something like this is possible because one will point to here, two will point to here, and this will point to here, this will point to here kind of thing. So you, so what are some of the, the, the good things about the system is it can grow to whatever, whatever size you want, right? It, it does not have to worry about where the files are and, and stuff like that. What are some of the, the bad things about Using such a scheme, yes. You're always placing some space for the pointer. Yeah, you're you're now wasting space for the pointers, right? 
because the pointer has to be part of the data block, so it, you're, you're wasting space. Right? If you want to find some part of the file, you have to go the whole way through the linked list, you, or the list, you can't just go to that point. Yeah, so, so see, yeah, if, you, if you want to go to the last byte of the file, right, you, in the worst case, you could actually have to follow through the rest of the files, so you, you're reading all these blocks to find out where the next pointer is and stuff, right? So from a performance standpoint, that could be really slow because you're trying to follow these pointers, right? In memory, it's not a big deal. You, know, you can follow pointers wherever you want to go, but when you're trying to do this on the disk, you're trying to, you're doing a slow operation over and over again. So there are, there are you know, on the plus side, you can go to whichever size you want. On the negative side, you lose some space for the pointers, you lose the, the notion of you know, being able to randomly go to some point in the file. Um, and you also lose the, I mean, unless you're careful, you kind of set up the file, you know, you end up having a file which is kind of not, not laid out nice, nicely, right? So, you know, from a, you know, from a, a more graphical perspective, so you start off with, so you, you, you tend to keep track of the start and the, the, the other problem you have with the linked list is, if for some reason you mess up this pointer, right? Because the operating system forgot to write that pointer onto disk or machine crashed before that or whatever, right? If you have only one way of getting there, then this whole file is, the rest of the file is lost, right? So from at this point, I can go to one, I can go to two, and then the rest of the blocks are still in the disk, <coughs> but I lost the pointer, so the whole file is, is now lost, right? So to avoid that, you have a doubly linked list. So at least one pointer would still get you some somewhere. So let's you know if you use that model, so you have a start and an end pointer. So essentially, the start says nine. So you go to nine. And nine tells you the next pointer where it is. So if you follow that along, you have your your file, right? So as you add more blocks, this pointer structure will change. So if you want to add a new block, right? You have to find out what the previous block is, what the next block is, update those pointers, right? So that now it points to the new one, right? And once you update it, you have to write them back to disk, right? So you have to read, so if you want, so if you have a pointer going from here to here, and if you want to add a new block, right? So you have the new block, you set this pointer to here, set this pointer to here, and write this block, write this block, write this block. So you're, instead of just writing the new block that you created, you have to update these blocks, right? So you're adding more writes and stuff, but this gives you a flexibility of, of creating larger files. And like I said, you could add this with the notion of extent where each, each one of these things may actually be quite large. So you have contiguous allocation for here, Contiguous allocation for here, here, and so on, and then kind of string them along to form these these pointers. And sort of this is how your your DAS fat fat file system work, right? The way they they don't write these pointers directly on the data block, they write them on a structure called fat or file allocation table. So essentially. It's a table which is which is kept separately as part of the hard disk, and that gives information about what are the blocks which are stringed together. So, for example, in the file, in that illustration there, file test, right? So it keeps track of what's the first data block, right? And so in this table, it keeps track of what are the different blocks, right? So, you know, 217 has the pointer to 618 which is a pointer to 339, and so on. So you follow along in this data structure, right? And the idea here is you would keep this in memory so you don't have to, so you can still have good random access, right? You keep this data structure in memory, and using that you can figure out what are the files that are part of, what are the blocks that are part of a particular file, right? And this is how Windows used to do it you know, in FAT and FAT32, right? And FAT and FAT32, it, it, it varies on how long these pointers are. And 32-bit pointer lets you have a larger files than the 
older ones, right? Back in the days, DOS used to be FAT16, in which case your files can't be too large. So essentially that's what they do, right? And so if you, if you, if this table gets host, then the whole disk is useless. And if you lose this table, then even though all your files are there, there's no way for you to figure out what really, what really is there. Um, so how many of you uh, used notions of like, like partition magic kind of thing? You know, um, in, in Windows you run these utilities to make the disk reorganize the disk and stuff, right? What tool did you use? Oh, partition magic. Partition magic. So how many of you? Uh, okay. To partition a different file or, or to do this optimization runs? To partition the disk. Okay. The, the, these partition tools also run the optimization part, right? Which tries to cluster these, these objects, right? It essentially, so once you do this stuff after a while, you have all these things messed up. So you can run some utilities which will read all this stuff. You know, now it knows that these files are here, so it'll create a new um, find a contiguous chunk, you know, create add them like this, and copy all the files over from here to there to get better performance, right? And you had to sort of do this in, in, in Windows to get better performance. You need to run these utilities, right? Um, essentially, that, that's how they, they, they do it. I'll, 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 I'll give a brief overview of what we're doing here before we continue up in the, in the next lecture. Right? So the, the next way of organizing this stuff is to have an index data structure. There are different ways of organizing this stuff, but essentially you, you have a, a, a block which has pointers to the different different data blocks, right? There are different ways of organizing this stuff, but essentially once you read this this block per file, you know all the blocks that are out there, right? So in the example over here, there are five pointers. So if your file is only as large as these five blocks, essentially I can read the index block and that gives me all the information about the five data blocks. So I can get to any one of these blocks randomly, and I can do a random access by just doing two disk read. I can read one disk, one to one disk to read the index table and then figure out where the data is, right? And the different variations we'll see is, you know, how to organize this index table in multiple levels or what have you. But essentially we move the different pointers into a, a block inside your own notion of your file and use that to sort of get you know, get to um, your block quicker. So it gives you better search ability and still let you grow, right? And Unix uses a sort of variant of this, of this, of this notion where it has multiple levels depending on what files there are. But <coughs> we'll continue with this on the next lecture. And if you if you want to drop by, you know, you can get a copy of the lecture today. I'll bring it back on, on Monday.